In the days when the world was young, there lived in France a little man of no importance. Everybody said he didn't amount to anything, and he firmly believed this himself. For he was just a traveling circus performer, a juggler. He couldn't read or write, and all he knew how to do was to go about from town to town following the little country fairs, doing his tricks for the children and earning a few pennies a day. His first name was Barnaby, but he was too unimportant to have any last name at all. Now when it was summertime and the weather was sunny and beautiful and the people were strolling around the streets and the young lovers were holding tightly to each other's hands in the park, then Barnaby would be happy because he could find a clear place in the village square, spread out a strip of old carpet on the cobblestones, and on the carpet he would perform his tricks for the children and grown-ups alike. And Barnaby, although he knew he was a man of no importance, was a wonderful juggler. You wouldn't believe half the things he could do. At first, he would only balance a tin pie plate on the tip of his nose. But when the crowd had collected, he would stand on his head and juggle six golden-colored balls in the air at the same time, catching them with his feet. And sometimes he could actually stand on his head and juggle 12 sharp knives instead of the golden balls and catch the knives with his feet too. And then the people would applaud and the children jump up and down with delight. And a whole rain of pennies would be thrown down onto Barnaby's carpet. And at the end of a day's work like this, Barnaby would collect the pennies in his hat and before wearily resting his aching muscles, he would kneel down on his carpet and reverently thank God for the hat full of pennies. And always the people would laugh at his simplicity, and everybody would agree that Barnaby would never amount to anything. But all this is about the happy days in his life, the summer days when the sun was shining and people were willing to toss a penny to a poor juggler. For when winter came, then Barnaby could afford no place to sleep, and he had to wrap up his juggling equipment in the old carpet and trudge along the muddy roads, begging a chance to sleep a night in a farmer's barn or doing his tricks for some rich person's servants in order to be given a meal. And Barnaby, of course, being so simple, never thought of complaining, for he knew that the winter and the rains were as necessary as the spring and the summer. And as he plodded along, he would say to himself, How could such an ignorant fellow as me ever hope for anything better? Now, one year in France, there was a terrible winter. And on an evening in early November, at the end of a dreary wet day, as Barnaby trudged along a country road, sad and bent, with the raindrops running down his face and off the end of his nose, Carrying under his arm the golden balls and knives in the old carpet, he saw something moving in the mist ahead of him. As he got closer, he saw that it was a fine, fat, white mule, and on top of the mule was a fine, fat monk, dressed in warm clothes and singing to himself as he rode along. When the monk saw poor, muddy Barnaby, he smiled at him and called out, It's going to be a cold evening. How would you like to come and spend the night where I live, at the monastery? Oh, cried Barnaby, running in the mud alongside of the mule. If I only could. But will they let an ignorant fellow like me enter such a holy place as a monastery? And the monk laughed. Of course, friend. For aren't we all ignorant as jackasses when we compare ourselves to the Lord? And the monk pulled Barnaby up behind him on the mule, and Barnaby had to hold both his arms around the monk's fat middle in order to stay on, and both of them began laughing again as they rode down the road. And that night, Barnaby found himself seated at the table in the huge dining room of the monastery. It was blazing with candles and silver candlesticks, and the table was covered with enormous roasts of fine, rare beef and legs of mutton swimming in gravy and whole roast pigs with red apples in their mouths and chicken pies and big cakes covered with crushed almonds and all the fresh apple cider you could drink. Although Barnaby, of course, sat down at the very foot of the table together with the servants and the beggars, he looked around with the candlelight shining in his eyes, and he thought he'd never seen such a wonderful sight this side of heaven. And suddenly, trembling with excitement, he jumped up, ran around the table to where the Lord Abbot, who was head of the monastery, sat at the top, and Barnaby sank down to his knees. Father, grant my prayer. Please let me stay here. I can't ever... 
hope to become a holy man. I'm too ignorant. But let me work in the stable and mop the kitchen floor and just stay. And the fat, jolly monk who'd met Barnaby turned to the head of the monastery. This is a good man. He's simple and pure of heart. And so the abbot nodded his head. And that night, Barnaby was given a cell of his own to sleep in. And he put his juggling equipment under the cot. And before he fell asleep, he promised solemnly that he would never again go back to his old profession of juggling six golden balls and 12 sharp knives. In the days that followed, everybody smiled to watch Barnaby work. He would scrub the flagstones of the kitchen floor and polish the big copper kettles, and with his strong acrobat's muscles knotting under the strain, he would willingly carry huge bundles of fodder to the cattle. And when the chapel bells rang out for services, he would creep humbly in by the side door and kneel down in a dark corner at the rear. And all through those early days, his face shone with happiness from morning until night, until two weeks before Christmas. And then a bewildered expression began to appear upon his simple face, and slowly his joy turned to misery and despair. For all around him, he saw every monk busy preparing a wonderful gift to place in the chapel on Christmas Day. There was Brother Maurice, who was a painter, who would take gold and silver and rare enamels and paint exquisite little miniature pictures on the corner of each page of a Bible. And then there was Brother Marbode, who was a sculptor and who was finishing a beautiful statue of Christ. This artist spent all of his hours in chiseling stone so that his beard and his eyebrows and his hair were always white with stone dust. And there was Brother Ambrose who was writing a new hymn to be sung at the Christmas service and Brother Joseph who was composing the music for it. Everywhere Barnaby went were these educated, trained men following their work, each one of them making a beautiful gift to dedicate to God on Christmas. And what about Barnaby? He could do nothing. He would go to his tiny cell and unwrap his juggling equipment and look at it sadly. I'm but a rough man, unskilled in art. I can't read or write. All I know how to do is to perform a few tricks. Alas, everybody has a gift to give except me. Christmas morning came at last, and strangely enough, it was the first day in that bitter winter that the sun broke out and shone brilliantly, and the great stone halls were decked out in pine branches and red holly berries, thousands of candles gleamed everywhere, and all of the buildings rang with music and songs. It took 25 of the monks to roll Brother Marbode's big new statue into the chapel. And then the choir sang the new song that had been written by Brother Ambrose. And then the beautiful Bible with the paintings of Brother Maurice was placed before the altar. And every brother went forward to present his gift to God. But Barnaby had disappeared. Now, a strange and terrible thing happened that no brother in the great monastery would ever forget during all the days of his life. For that evening, after the visitors had gone home and the chapel was deserted and nearly all the brothers were resting on their hard beds, the plump, jolly monk who had brought Barnaby to the monastery went running down the halls with his face white as a ghost's. He pounded over the stone floors to the private room of the abbot. He shoved open the door without knocking, and panting with excitement, he seized the abbot by the arm. Father, a frightful thing is happening, the most terrible sacrilege ever to take place in a church. Come with me. Without speaking a word, the abbot joined him, and the two elderly men ran down the corridors, burst through a door, and came out on the choir balcony at the rear of the chapel. The monk pointed a trembling finger down toward the altar. The abbot looked, turned ashen in color. God forgive him, he has gone mad. Ave Maria. Down 
down below, squarely in front of the altar, was Barnaby. He had spread out his old strip of carpet and kneeling reverently on one knee, was juggling in the air six golden balls. He was presenting his old act, the bright knives, the shining balls, and at the very tip of his nose was balanced a tin pie plate, and on his face was a look of adoration and joy. We must seize him and drag him away, cried the abbot, and the two men turned toward the door. But at that exact moment, a dazzling light suddenly filled the chapel, a brilliant beam coming directly from the altar, and both the monks sank to their knees. For as Barnaby had finished his juggling act and knelt exhausted on his carpet, they saw the statue of the Virgin Mary move. She came down from her pedestal, and coming to where Barnaby knelt, She reached down and took the blue hem of her robe and touched it to his forehead, gently drying the beads of sweat that glistened there. And the light dimmed. And up in the choir balcony, the monk looked at the abbot. God has accepted the only Christmas present he had to give. And the abbot slowly nodded. Blessed are the simple in heart, for they also shall see God. Ave Maria.